Church and our online family and friends. Thank you once again for joining us for Bible study on tonight. We pray that you will click that share button and start a watch party with your family and friends. Our scripture will come from Habakkuk 3, 17 through 19. Habakkuk 3, 17 through 19. And it reads, even though the fig trees have no blossom, and there are no grapes on the vine, even though the olive crop fails and the fields lie empty and barren, even though the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty, yet will I rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful to the God of my salvation. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes me as sure-footed as a deer, able to tread upon the heights. Habakkuk is praising God because he knows that God has all power. God is sovereign. He is the supreme ruler. And the message to us is, since we know that God is in control, we have to wait on God. Even in the midst of trouble, in the midst of this pandemic, we must be patient and trusting God's promises and following the plan that God has for our lives. Whatever happens to me, whatever happens to you, let us trust God and praise God because God is the one who saves and he gives us the strength to make it through. When we know God's character, that's who he is. In his works, what he has done, we know that we can trust him even in the dark when we can't see him. But we can't do it without God's strength. So we need God's strength and his power to help us make it through. Our song tonight is <clears throat> You Are My Strength. You are my strength, strength like no other. You are my hope, hope like no other. The hope, it reaches to me. In the fullness of your grace, in the power of your name, you lift me up. You are my strength. You are my strength. Strength like no
Father God, we thank you now, Lord. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for another privilege, another chance, another opportunity to come before you. Lord, we thank you for blessing us and keeping us. We thank you, Father God, for who you are. Lord, you are God. You are good. You're the one that has blessed us one more time to be on the land of the living. Lord, we thank you, Father God, for keeping us in your will and your way. We thank you, Father God, for giving us a mind to worship you, a heart that is turned toward you. We thank you and we glorify you, Father God, for you are the great God. You are the great King. You are the one who blesses us and keeps us. Now, Lord, we come blessing you tonight, for we realize, Father God, if we are to hear from heaven, we have to hear through you. Now, Lord, we ask you to bless your word. Bless your word to fall on good soil, that your word will go forth, Father God, and make us better than who we are at this moment. We ask you to continue to walk with us, Father God. Bless us through your word tonight, that your word, Father God, will be medicine to our flesh. And Lord, we ask you to keep the glory, all the honor and all the, all the praise. We ask you to bless us in Jesus' name. Amen and thank God. You are, Lord. In the fullness of your grace. You are, Lord. In the power of your name. You lift me up. Yes, you do. Yes, you, you do. You lift me up. You are my strength. You are my strength. You are my hope. Strength like no other. You are my strength like none other. Strength like no other. Like no other. Like anybody else. Lord, we thank you. Thank you so much for joining us here at our New Beginning Church lo uh, remote location. Thank you for being a part of our service on tonight. We're in Bible study in Colossians chapter 2. Our Bible study for tonight is in Colossians chapter 2. We will seek to cover three verses on tonight, verses 6, 7, and 8. Verses 6, 7, and 8 is where we are tonight. Please turn your Bibles, get your pens and your paper out. Let's take notes. Let's make sure that the Lord speak with us, speak through us, and speak to us on tonight. Amen? God has somebody in your path that he will place in your path if he's not already in your path, if she's not already in your path, that you can share the word with, and we praise God for it. Amen? Thank God for the privilege of hearing from his word. Colossians chapter 2 verses 6 through 8, Colossians chapter 2, verses 6, 7, and 8 is where we are tonight. We thank God for this privilege of his word. We are here and Apostle Paul is writing. And in the Apostle Paul's writing, he's dealing with the church at Colossae. And on last week, we found out in chapter 2, he begins dealing with the church at Laodicea. Laodicea. He's dealing with that, those two churches on tonight, and what he's saying to them is, even though I haven't seen you, even though I have not been in your presence, I'm concerned about you. He says to them that there's a great conflict going on, and I have gone through great conflict. I've gone through great conflict for those at Laodicea, and I, have, I want you to know that uh, in the flesh, I am having great conflict. Even though you have not seen me in the flesh, even though you have not seen me face to face, I want you to know that I, I, my heart is turned toward you and I want your hearts to be encouraged. He says that I want your hearts to be knitted together in love. He says to them that, he, that you may obtain all the riches in the full assurance of the understanding of the knowledge of the mystery of God. And we talked to you on last week to let you know that this mystery of God is Christ Jesus himself. He says, both the Father and of the Christ. He wants you to know that there's a mystery of the Father and the Son. He wants you to know that this mystery is found in Jesus Christ. He goes on to say, whom these mysteries in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and of knowledge. Mm -hmm. There are great treasures hidden 
And these treasures are hidden in the word of God. These treasures are hidden in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Many times you hear people talking and they will say that God works in mysterious ways. But the Bible says those mysterious ways have been revealed. In other words, the great mystery that we have before us on tonight and as we read the word of God, it is found in Jesus Christ, none other than Jesus Christ himself. He says there's knowledge, <clears throat> there's wisdom, and this knowledge and this wisdom carries the great treasures of God. And they are found through Jesus Christ himself. Hallelujah. Hallelujah Amen. to the Lamb. In verse 4, he says, To make sure, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words, that you walk in Christ Jesus. He says, For, for though I was absent in the flesh, for even though I'm absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit. We've heard people talk about that also in the fact that I, I won't be with you all. I can't be there, but I'm there with you in the spirit. Paul says, even though I'm not present with you, even though I'm absent in the flesh, I'm with you in the spirit. And I'm doing something while I'm with you. I'm rejoicing. I'm rejoicing. Mm -hmm. I am rejoicing to see your good work, your good uh, order, your, your good arrangement of things in the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. Mm -hmm. he's, he's glad about it. We ought to be glad when we see people walking in the steadfastness in the faith of Jesus Christ. We ought to be excited about it. We ought to be glad to see people go from one thing to another thing. We ought to be glad to see people grow from one little point to another point. Yeah. We ought to see people grow and get excited about it. Yes. The Apostle Paul says, I rejoice. Mm -hmm. He says that I am glad to see you stretch fast in the faith. Let me tell you why he's glad to see them stretch fast in the faith. Number one is because there was a great principle going around, a great illusion going around. The Gnostics were spewing out false doctrine. Mm -hmm. The Gnostics, the Gnostics believed that, that God himself didn't really create this great world. The Gnostics believed that some force, some energy took place and this world just came into being. The Gnostics even believed that Jesus Christ was not the son of God who was born of a virgin called Mary by the impression of God himself upon Mary's life. The Gnostics believed that who would God be or what would God be if he was such a great God that he would punish us, yes. that he would take us and allow us to go through, through suffering. Well, we all know that the reason why we go through suffering is because of man's sin. Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. That sin was passed. That sin nature was passed down through generations to us. So let me just share with you, the fact of the matter is the Gnostics were spewing out false doctrine. They, they spewed out doctrine that was not of God. Just like men are today. Men today are spewing out doctrine that is not godly doctrine. It is not doctrine that God is pleased with. It is not a doctrine that, that promotes Jesus Christ and his righteousness. So every now and then you will hear men and you will see men who will be about telling people things that are not lined up with the word of God. We want to make sure that we follow those things in the word, the things of Jesus Christ. Yes. So that, that's, that's how it was during that day and that's how it is during this day. There are false prophets all around us. Yes. There are people who are prophesying who are really prophesying. Mm. There are people who are saying things that's not written in the word. I was listening to the radio one day, and I say this very often. I was listening to the radio one day, and this lady was talking, and she said, God will tell you something that is not in your word. I turned the radio off. I flipped it to another channel, 
I begin to shut it down because that is not true. If it's not in God's word, it's not of God. And yeah, you're going to go through some things that you can't, God is not going to say that these are the things that, that you, uh, you will go through. But when you look at God's word, he's always clear and he's always precise that whenever somebody else gone, have gone through some things, God will be there for you. We don't have people in the lion's den today, but we believe that God watched over Daniel in the lion's den. Mm -hmm. And the lion's den that Daniel was in, he was tossed in it because of his religious or sanctimonious beliefs. We today are being tossed in lion's dens. Yes. It's not a physical den, but they are, there are dens that, that they put us in because of the pencil, the pen. Mm -hmm. We are in a lion's den today because people won't vote. Mm -hmm. We're in a lion's den today because people chose not to vote. We're in a lion's den today because of things that we have chosen and God does not ordain. Mm -hmm. God does not sanction it. So we're in lion's dens. We're in lion's dens. We're in the lion's den today. <laughs> the United States of America is in a great lion's den. Well, we don't see people or hear people every day that are being swallowed up by a big fish. But we are being swallowed up every day by politicalness. <laughs> we are being swallowed up every day by, by, by things that we cannot control. God is saying in his word that he'll be there with you. Yes, he is. Just trust him. Let's look at what he says in verse number six. Colossians chapter two is where we are. Verse number six. He just finished telling these saints, these new converts, rejoice in the Lord. I'm rejoicing for you. And he says, I'm rejoicing because of your steadfast faith in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. So he says in verse number six. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him. Mm -hmm. He says, you, you received Jesus Christ. You've been born again. God has changed you. Mm -hmm. He has rearranged your heart. He has put you on a destiny to, for heaven. When you die, you know you're going to heaven when you die. Because you believe the story of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Therefore, you trust that word, that story, that, that redeeming story that Jesus died for your sins, rose from the dead. You believe this story. Therefore, you trust this story to get you to heaven. There's nothing you can do to get to heaven other than trust Jesus Christ and what he's already done on Calvary. Jesus' death on Calvary mm -hmm. and his resurrection that third day has set us on a path to get to heaven. Yes. Our works can't get us there. Our church attendance can't get us there. Our hope in nothing other than Jesus Christ and his righteousness alone can get us to heaven. Mm -hmm. Nothing else can get us to heaven other than Jesus' righteousness. Yes. And he gave it up for us on Calvary. He gave his life for us on Calvary. Mm -hmm. And if we can trust that story, we're on our way to heaven. Look at what he says in Colossians chapter 2, verse number 6. As if he's saying, therefore, he says, as you therefore, as you have therefore, therefore means certainly. Therefore means verily. Therefore means so. So he says, he says, as you therefore, as you so, as you certainly, as you verily, as you therefore have received Jesus Christ the Lord. Because you received Jesus Christ, now you are associated with him. You are taken up with Jesus Christ. You have been taken up into a point where you've been taken with Jesus. You have been taken on to Jesus. You have been taken up with Jesus Christ. You have received Jesus Christ. He urged these Christians that you need to know that you have assumed a new office. 
There it comes with the idea that you have obtained a new office. It comes with the idea that Jesus Christ has given you a new position. That's why Paul says that when, when we receive Jesus Christ, we have a new position in him. Our condition is one that's messed up. But our condition, our condition has no impression on our position. Our position in Christ Jesus have settled the case for us. Our position in Christ Jesus qualifies us for heaven. Not because we qualify for heaven, but because of what Jesus has done on the cross for us. Now we qualify for heaven. We're not qualified material. We, we're not refined material. We're not good enough material. But because Jesus Christ have paid our fare, because Jesus Christ has paid the cost for us, now we can go to heaven. That's good news. That, that is good news. That's good news. That is good news. The reason why it's such a good news is because without Christ, we won't get to heaven. Mm -hmm. we, we are now, we are now, we are now associated with Christ in such a way that now we are headed to heaven because we've trusted the story of Jesus Christ. And so he says, since you have received Christ, Therefore, since you have certainly received Christ, walk in him. Right, right. He says, he says, now you say you are a Christian. Hmm. You say you are a Christian. He says, walk in him. You say that Christ, the anointed one, Christ, the Messiah, Christ, the express characteristics of the person of God, Christ. Jesus, the Son of God, you say that you are a part of him. You say that you are now a Christian. You ought to walk in him. Amen. This word walk means to occupy. This word walk means to live, to follow his instruction. It is the idea of a deportation. It is the idea of being deported from one place to another place. Let me tell you, if you're saved, if you're born again, if you have Jesus Christ in your heart, you are being deported from earth to heaven. Amen. We've been deported. We, we have been moved from earth to heaven. It, we are physically still here, but we are already in heaven already. Amen. You see, because there is a, there is a physical position, we're still here. But spiritually, God has already placed us on the other side. And because we've been placed in a heavenly place, we ought to walk as if we're in a heavenly place. We ought to act like we're in a heavenly place. We ought not be foul. We, we ought to not be the one that's already always starting trouble. We ought to have a godly example when we move, Amen. when people see us, how we travel, how we occupy this earth. We ought to have a godly example about us. People ought to see Jesus Christ in us. And that's, that's, that has nothing to do with who you used to be. Yeah, that's right. So people who look at who you used to be cannot point at you and condemn you because you've been deported. You've been moved from an earthly being to a heavenly being. Oh, let me tell you, God has blessed you. If you're saved, you just, the problem with those who are saved, those who are born again, they don't know what they have in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Paul says, uh, therefore, if you're in Christ, therefore, since you have received Christ Jesus, the Lord, walk in him means to occupy with him. And it, it comes with the idea of, of working together in this Christian life. You ought to be able to work together. You, you ought to be able to work with God. You ought to be able to work with Jesus. Yeah. This word, this word, this word walk means that I'm a co-laborer with Christ Jesus. There is not a better co-worker you can have. Yes. He says, 
it comes to a point where we are to work together in life. And be, if we are co-laborers with Christ Jesus, if, if we are walking in Christ Jesus, we ought to be able to get along with other folk and walk with them. <laughs> we ought to be able to make it. And some of us have to get along with our enemies because we're in Christ. And when you're in Christ, you need to be able to get along with your enemies. Mm -hmm. We talk about God making our enemies our footstool. In order for God to make your enemies your footstools, you got to be willing <laughs> to collaborate. Mm -hmm. You must be willing to coexist. You must be willing to walk in the presence of your enemies and allow God to spread the table for you. Yes. The psalmist says that he prepared the table before my enemies in their very presence. If God is going to prepare the table before you in the presence of your enemies, you need to understand God is preparing the table. Mm -hmm. You just need to go through the preparation process to get to the table. And many times the preparation process is persecution. Many times the preparation process is prosecution. Many times the preparation process is, is suffering. Mm -hmm. Paul is saying to us, as he said to the church at Colossae and the church at Lodicea, he's saying to us today that we've got to be willing to walk in him. And when we walk in him, that doesn't mean that we're not going to have any problems. When we walk in him, it doesn't mean that we're going to have everything our way. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, we have to suffer through some things. Yes. We have to live through some things that we'd rather not live through. But when we suffer for Christ's sake, we're able to be blessed of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And God is able to bless us. We have to be willing to walk in him. So he says in verse number six that therefore you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. And because you received him, you ought to walk in him. You ought to act like you're with him. And then in verse number seven, he tells us how we ought to walk in him. He says, rooted and built up in him. We must be stabilized. The word rooted, rooted means to be stabilized. We must be stabilized. We must be stabilized. Let me tell you, a double-minded man, a double-minded woman, a double-minded child is unstable in all of his and her ways. Right. A double-minded person. The problem is when you can't make up your mind to walk in Christ. Mm -hmm. He says you got to be rooted. This right. word rooted comes from a farmer's word where, where the roots of the tree go down into the earth. Mm -hmm. And any farmer will tell you, as tall as a tree is, then the root goes down that deep into the earth. Some trees have what is called a tap root. That tap root goes straight down. And that tap root governs the whole tree because it stabilizes that tree. Mm -hmm. What Paul says to us tonight is that you need to be rooted. Yes. You need to be stabilized. You, you need to be grounded in the Lord. And, and it comes with the idea that when you're rooted and grounded, you're not tossed to and fro by any wind or doctrine. Yes. What it means is Paul is warning them, as I'm warning you tonight, don't let people fool you. Right. And that's further down in the verse. He says you ought to be rooted and you ought to be built up. Built up comes from the word akademi, means to be to be edified, to be built up. It means to be reared up. It means to be built upon it. It means to be built there upon. What he's saying is you must be built up in him. Too often we depend on people to sanction us. We depend on people to to, to give us credence. We depend on people to be satisfied with us. We, we depend on people to build us up. Mm -hmm. But we need to depend on people only for what God has placed them for as a support system. 
but we ought to be built up in Christ Jesus. We ought to be built up in Christ Jesus. God has given us Jesus to rear us up, to build us up. He says we ought to be rooted and built up in him. Our confidence ought to come through Christ Jesus. Our confidence ought to be placed in Christ Jesus. Verse number seven, Colossians chapter two says, we are to walk in him, rooted and built up in him. Mm -hmm. Then he says, established. We ought to be established in the faith. First of all, he says, we ought to be built up, rooted, grounded, and built up in Christ Jesus. And then he says, we ought to be established in the faith. The word established means that we ought to be confirmed. We ought to be steadfast in the faith. We ought to be sure in the faith. We ought to be so sure in this faith until it becomes something that is forceful to us. When you talk to a saint of God, you talk to somebody who loves the Lord, somebody who's been saved, somebody who's been sanctified and set apart for the, the Lord's work. When you talk to that person, they ought to be established. Yes. They, they ought to be steadfast. Nothing can shake their faith. They ought to have faith. This word faith comes from the word pistis. In the original Greek, this word pistis means assurance. This word pistis, pistis means, means a belief, a credence, a reliance, a conviction. I have a strong conviction. Your faith ought to be so established your conviction ought to be sure regardless of what the wind or the waves bring. Regardless of who's beside you, regardless of who's watching you. I notice sometimes when people invite guests to the church, they don't want to say amen as long as their guests are there. But, but Paul says to us that our faith ought to be so strong. It ought to, we ought to have such assurance that we are not embarrassed by people. Reverend Al Sharpton tells a story about inviting his friends, his friends to church with him. He said uh, his mama always would shout at church, so she, he wanted to warn her that mama, I'm bringing some friends to the church. And I noticed every Sunday, mama, when the preacher gets good and the preaching gets good, I noticed that you, you lean to the side. And I noticed that, that you find yourself standing up. And I noticed that you get up on your feet and you start moving and jumping. Now, Mama, this Sunday, I'm going to bring my, my friends to church. He, she said, okay, baby, I got you. I got you, baby. And well, all of, all, of, all of a sudden, he walks in and he sits with his friends because he doesn't want to sit with his mama. He sits with his friends. And the preaching got good. And the preacher got good. <laughs> and all of a sudden, there his mama is. He didn't want her, him to, he didn't want her to embarrass him. But the preaching got good. All of a sudden, mama leaned to the side. Then she started moving. And all of a sudden, she got up. And she started waving her hand. And his mama had done just what he asked her not to do. It's because of her assurance, her belief in Jesus Christ, she wasn't going to let anything shake her faith. Yes. <laughs> Al Sharpton went to the hospital. He had gotten stabbed. And the doctor told the nurse, don't let him move. But one thing about it, he got stabbed and he, if he moves, he, he will bleed to death. Don't let him move. Al Sharpton wakes up and he, he hears the doctor telling the nurse, uh, don't let him move. And, and, and he, he realized that he's still here. He realizes that he's still living. And he, the, the, the nurse is trying to hold him in place. And all of a sudden, Al Sharpton leaned to the side. Al Sharpton stood up. And begin to wave his hand. Let me tell you, when your faith has been secure in Jesus yes. Christ, yes. when you've been through some things, yes. it doesn't matter who else is there. Yes. Your faith is sure. 
And if it's your thing to exemplify your faith through movement, through shaking your hands, through hugging yourself, through raising your hands, through shaking your head, if your faith has been established, if your faith is in Jesus Christ, you don't mind who cares or who sees. Or you don't mind who's present. Paul is saying to these new converts, you need an established faith. And you need to be so established in your faith that nothing, nothing can, can, can shape you and nothing can move you. He says, as you have been taught. Paul says to them tonight, he says, as he says to us, that you need to understand that you've been taught this faith. You need to understand that your faith has been built up through Jesus Christ. You need to understand that you are Christians. You are of Christ. You are rooted. You are to, to be rooted and built up in Christ Jesus. Yes. And regardless of what somebody else says, regardless of what new doctrine is here, you need to understand that you've been taught the right way. Yes. This word taught means to be imparted into. This word taught means that you have already learned this. Too often, we don't exemplify what we've learned. Too often, we try to shake that which God has, has taken us through. Too often, we get embarrassed about what God has taught us and through what the word has taught us. It's a sad day when a girl or a boy who grew up in Sunday school, who know the principles of God, go off to college and come back, and now somebody has told them something different, and now they decided they're going to be a Muslim or a philosopher. This is what Paul is warning them about. He says, regardless of who you go around, be established in your faith. Yeah. Regardless of, of how educated you get, be established in your faith. Be grounded in the Lord Jesus. Mm -hmm. This is a pandemic we are coming through. Yeah. And we are going through it. Yes. We're, we're in the middle of a pandemic. And a lot of people's faith is being shaken during this pandemic. Let me tell you, whatever you have been taught in the Lord Jesus, stay established in that faith. Amen. Occupy in him, walk in him, bless him, and stay with him. He says, he says in verse number seven, rooted and built up in Christ Jesus, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith as you have been taught. Abounding in it with thanksgiving, mm -hmm. abounding in it. This word abounding means excelling. The word abounding means increasing. The word abounding means abundantly remaining in him. What this word abounding really means is super abounding, which means we ought to be growing in Christ Jesus. We ought not just get to know him, and shut it down. It, it's a sad day when a person uh, identifies themselves as one who's been in Christ for 20, 30, 40 years, and they still look the same, they still act the same, they still believe the same. It's a sad day when grown people who are in Christ Jesus can tell other folk in Christ that this is how I am. You just got to accept me for who I am. What you just said to me is you're born in Christ Jesus, but you're dead in Christ Jesus. What you just said to me is you're not abounding in him. You're not growing in him. You're not increasing in him. And it doesn't matter how long you've been born again. It doesn't matter how long you've been saved. You need Jesus every day. Amen. The songwriter says every second, every minute, every hour, every day, every week, every month, every year. We need Jesus every day. Because if Jesus leaves us alone, we all would be in a bad situation. So we ought to be abounding in him. We ought to be excelling in him. We ought to be increasing in him so we can have abundance in him. In other words, we ought to remain in Jesus Christ. And look at what he says. He says, with thanksgiving. Abounding in it. It 
this faith, in abounding in faith, and this faith comes through Jesus Christ with thanksgiving. We ought to be thankful. The word thanksgiving means thank worthy. The word thanksgiving means thankfulness. The word thanksgiving means gratitude to God till it become an act of worship. You see, this word thanksgiving means that this ought to be an act of worship for us. It ought not be the last Thursday or the fourth Thursday in November. It ought not just be Thanksgiving Day. I mean, families get together and they have this great prayer and thanking Lord, the Lord for another great Thanksgiving Day. These things we ought to do, but it ought not be limited to Thanksgiving Day. Thanksgiving ought to be every day. Because it ought to be a worship moment for you. You ought to thank him for who he is. Thank him for what he's done. Praise him for what he's going to do. It ought to be thanksgiving. In other words, you ought to be abounding in the faith. You ought to be walking in Jesus Christ. You ought to be rejoicing in him. Because you received Jesus Christ, you ought to be thankful for what God has already done. With thanksgiving. Let me, see, let me just tell you, when God saved you, he did something. <laughs> it doesn't matter if you, had, you thought you ever sinned or not. You were born in sin. When God saved you, he performed a miracle. Yes, he did. I oftentimes say that the greatest miracle that one will ever experience is the saving of a lost soul. Yes. The greatest miracle that anyone will ever experience is the saving of a lost soul. God saved you from, uh, healed you from cancer. Great. Mm -hmm. God healed you from HIV. Excellent. But it's still not the greatest miracle. The greatest miracle that one will ever, ever receive is the saving of a lost soul. Mm -hmm. If your soul is not saved, you have not experienced the greatest miracle. So he says, you ought to receive this miracle, this salvation. This, 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 he, he speaks of salvation, and he also speaks of sanctification. When he says that you're saved through Christ, that's salvation. Mm -hmm. When he says walk in him, that's sanctification. We all ought to be sanctified. We all ought to walk in him. We all ought to, ought to respect him to the point where we do what he says to do. We ought to be obedient unto him. So this word thanksgiving is an act of worship. You ought to be thankful unto him, and so much so until you worship him. It ought to be your act of appreciation. It ought to be your act of gratitude. Lord, I thank you. Before your feet hit the floor, in the morning when your eyes fly open, say, Lord, I thank you. Before you get about your daily duty, you ought to be thankful to the Lord. Before you go from A to B, before you have your first meeting, you ought to stop for a moment and say, Lord, I thank you. And thanking him ought not be just thanking him. It ought to be an act of worship. Yes. Paul says here that, that you ought to you ought to have thanksgiving. You're always abounding in your faith, always abounding in it, always abounding in Christ, always abounding in him, increasing in him with thanksgiving, yes. with worship, with praise, with honor, with glory. Lord, we thank you. Jesus picks this thought up. And Jesus says in Matthew chapter six, when you pray, you ought to pray like this. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And he's not talking about Hollywood either. <laughs> hallowed be your name. Lord, we glorify you. Lord, we magnify you. Lord, we worship you. Amen. Lord, we praise you. Lord, we make you big before other men. Lord, you are God and you're God alone. Before you do anything, Lord, you are who you are, and you are the only one like you. There's no one like you. Try it sometime. Thank God. Thank God for who he is. Praise him for what he's done. Thank him for what he's going to do. And praise God for how he's handling life. 
And Paul says, this is how you handle your salvation experience. Walk in faith, rooted and grounded, established in your faith, walking and built up in him. And then number eight, verse number eight, Colossians chapter two, he says, this is the reason why. He says, beware, lest anyone cheat you. I'm reading New King James. He says, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, mm -hmm. according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. Look at what he says. He lays it out. Yeah. He says, be aware. Mm -hmm. In other words, take heed of these, these principles I've given you in verses 6 and 7. He says, take heed, be aware. Beware, perceive. Beware, look to. Beware, seeing. Beware, regarding. He says, beware lest anyone. Word less means if you don't do this, then this will happen. Less mean whether, lack, or God forbid. He says, beware lest anyone cheats you. The word cheat means to spoil or seduce. Remember, there's false prophets out here. What he's saying to them is, there are people who are Gnostics that are telling you that God is not really the only true God. There are Gnostics out here who don't believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God, born of Mary, gave his life as a ransom for you and me. He says, beware of these things, lest anyone cheats you. The word cheats means to spoil or seduce you. You see, men are conning with their words. Men can say one thing, and before that sentence is over, they can say another thing. Men will say that I'm going to protect pre-existing diseases mm -hmm. while they're in court to cut out pre-existing medications, pre-existing hospitalizations. Men will tell you in one breath, that I am here to protect you, I'm here to look out for you, and they're cutting you, not only sticking you in your back, they're pulling the knife down your back at the same time. Paul says that there are some in the faith like this. There are men who are out to connive, seduce, cheat, and spar those of us who are walking in Christ. He says, be aware of this. He says, beware, beware, be conscious now, lest anyone cheats you through their philosophy and empty deceit. Philosophy, the wisdom of man. Philosophy, the intelligence and the intellect. Philosophy, this false teaching. You see, God has no problem with Christians being involved in philosophy. God has no problem with the philosophy itself. But when philosophy cuts across what God is saying to us, when philosophy overshadows Jesus Christ and the faith we have in him, mm -hmm. then God has a problem with that. Paul says to this church at Colossae, he says to them, be aware, beware, <laughs> be advised, that you will not be cheated or spoiled by those who will give you philosophy, intelligence, false teaching, man's wisdom. In empty deceit, empty, vain, deceit, delusion, people will make you think one thing when it's really something else. I oftentimes have the privilege of asking somebody, you trying to really make me think that it's raining outside when you actually just TT it on my leg. You really expect me to think that what's on my leg is rain when there's not a cloud in the sky, there's not a raindrop falling, 
You really want me to think that it's raining when you're really trying to TT on my leg. <laughs> it's because men will tell you anything. Paul says, whatever you do, don't get caught up in this empty deceit, this trickery. Don't get caught up in this vain delusion because men will always have tradition according to the tradition of men. We ought to do things according to our custom, but we ought not do things because of tradition. We ought not do things just because it's been done that way all along. We ought to do things because it's of God. Paul says to them, don't get caught up with this empty deceit, this philosophy in the tradition of men according to the basic principles of the world. The world has principles that are different from godly principles. These basic principles are simply elementary spirits. There are spirits out here that people will try to make you believe in that are not of God. They are actually of the world. This word world is cosmos. This word world is arrangement or the decoration or the adorning of things. The reason why people put decorations out is because they're covering up imperfections. Ooh, thank you, Lord. They are covering up something that they don't want you to see. They're making it look good. They're making it look pretty. They're putting out an arrangement because they're covering up something. They're beautifying it. Let me tell you, the world offers us beautification. Yeah. The world offers us good looking stuff. He says, don't be caught up in the traditions of men according to the basic principles of this world. The world is an arrangement of things. The world is a decoration, a adorning of things. And finally, he says, he closes out verse number eight and I'll close. He says to us today, and not according to Christ. He says, don't get caught up in stuff of the world, but get caught up in stuff of Christ. Those things that are of Christ, those things that are according to Jesus Christ. Get caught up in those things. We're getting caught up in everything other than those things that deals with Jesus Christ. Don't let the world seduce you, he says. Don't let the world give you a delusion. Stand firm. Be well grounded. Be established. Be built up in the faith of Jesus Christ and Christ alone. Amen. He's the one that's going to get you to heaven. Amen. He's the one that's going to make sure that you get to heaven. He's the one who died for you. And I oftentimes get into to, to conversations, not debates, but conversations, where men will tell you that you have to go out and do things to please your king. Pray and, and spend your time fighting for your king. President of the United States, send our 18, 19, 20-year-olds across seas to fight for him. But I thank God for Jesus, Amen. our King of King, the conquering King of Calvary. He doesn't send us out to fight for him. He fought the battle for us, yes. gave his life for us. And if you're listening to me today, and you've never received this Jesus Christ that I'm talking about. I want to let you know he fought the battle for you. Yes, he, did. he won the war for you. He died for you. And if you don't think that he loves you, I want to tell you, God loves you. He loves you so much that he gave his only unique son. He, he loves you so much that he gave his only begotten son. He loves you so much, he gave his one-of-a-kind son. Jesus is the Christ for you. If you're listening to me today, the door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. You need to come to Jesus. Remember, remember, don't get caught up in philosophies. Don't get caught up into empty deceit. You've tried it. 
You've tried her. You've tried him. You've tried them. I say try Jesus. You won't be disappointed. The door of the church is open. This is your moment. You can be saved right here, right now. Right here on the air. Right here virtually. Yeah, we are virtually presenting. But you can be saved actually. You can get to know him today. And all you have to do is just join me in this prayer, believing the story of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. If you would, just bow your head with me and invite Christ into your life so you can qualify through him for heaven when you die. Men, women, boys, and girls are dying every second of the day. You want to be saved when you die. You want to go to heaven when you die. You want to know Jesus when you die. Bow your head with me and repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life. And make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and thank God. We believe if you prayed that prayer and really believe the story that Jesus died and rose again, we believe that you're born again. And from this day forward, you're on your way to heaven. There may be some who are present with us today who have Receive Christ as your Savior, but for some reason or the other, you've been vacillating. You have not trusted Jesus to the point where you walk in him. Paul says, walk in Christ, rooted and grounded. You may have turned your back on Jesus Christ. You may have turned your back on the church. The church may have hurt you. This is your moment. I want to pray with you and pray for you. That Jesus will give you the fire, the fervor. Give you the desire to, to walk with him. I pray God's best blessing upon your life. I pray that you receive him. And he gives you the fire as you had when you were saved. And if you want to recommit, inbox me and let me know you want to rededicate or recommit yourself to Jesus Christ. Those of you who have received Jesus Christ today on this broadcast, inbox me, message me, and let me know that you received him so we can rejoice with you. And if you're listening to me and you're in between churches or you don't have a church home, I recommend this one, the New Beginning Church. You can join virtually in Boston. You can join in person. You can join over the air. Just inbox me. We will celebrate with you and welcome you to the family of faith. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for our Bible study. Thank you for being a part of our service on Sundays and, and Wednesdays. And now it is offering time. It is time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial giving. And it's time to give to the Lord. And you can do so by three different means. You can do so by cash app. You can send your money by cash app, dollar sign NBC Souls, dollar sign NBC Souls, cash tag NBC Souls is our cash app. Or you can send it by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. That's our Zelle account. Or you can mail in your offering to 
New Beginning Church, P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That's New Beginning Church, P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That's P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Again, thank you for joining us here tonight for our Bible study. You can meet us here every Wednesday night by way of Zoom or by way of Facebook Live. Please join us on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. for our Sunday school. Please join us at 1045 a.m. for our worship service. We're so glad that you've joined us here tonight. <clears throat> Please register to vote. If you haven't registered to vote, now is a good time to register to vote. Please, ma'am, please, sir, go ahead and register to vote. You need to vote. Every person over 18 need to vote. Register to vote. And my second plea is vote. Vote. President Obama said it well. Don't boo. Vote. Reverend Al Sharpton said it very well. He that marches, he that protests, and does not vote, you're just talking loud and saying nothing. This is the most critical time for us to vote in all the world. This is the most critical time for us to vote in all the ages. We need to vote. Third thing I want you to do is pray. Pray for churches, pray for pastors, pray for decisions. We're lifting up the Holman Street Church and we're, we're lifting up new Mount Calvary Church. We're lifting these two churches before the Lord. Please pray for the New Beginning Church and pray, pray for each other. Here at the New Beginning Church, we are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we're reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, In I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12 and 32. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for another privilege, another honor, another opportunity to come before you. Lord, we ask you to bless us, Father God, that we will walk in Jesus Christ. Bless us, Father God, that we will increase in the faith, that we will always abound in him. Bless us, Father God, that we will walk with you in such a way, Father God, that our faith will be made sure that we will be established, rooted, and grounded in Christ Jesus, that we will not be tossed to and fro by any wind or doctrine, but we will walk with Jesus and Jesus alone. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, unto him the only wise and only true God, unto him be power, glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us join by saying, amen, amen, and amen. God bless you. And God keep you is our prayer.